Wonderful. So welcome again. I'm Miriam. I'm the founder and director of Project Mia and also co-founder of Survived and Punish. And I'm welcoming you, I'm welcoming you this evening or afternoon, depending on where you are, on behalf of both groups. Um, thanks to Eva, who has held down much of the logistics for this event. This session is part of Project Mia's ongoing series titled Building Your Abolitionist Toolbox. Our goal in the series is to explore different resources um, that help us build daily practices to move us closer to a world free of imprisonment, policing, and surveillance. Together, we are learning how we can use abolitionist organizing tools and values in our relationship, in our homes, in our schools, and in our organizations, as well as in our communities. Um, we're considering how we can deepen discussions about justice, about harm, and about healing. And we're diving into active ways that we can work towards an abolitionist future that includes everyone. I'm gonna drop in the chat um, that you can find a link to a site that includes resources and information um, based on all previous sessions that we've had in this series. So you can find resources, including some videos, graphic notes, um, the actual resources that we will feature during the series. Our next session in the series is on March 25th, and it will be facilitated by Vision Win Change, specifically Ejeris Dixon and Che Long. They're gonna introduce us to and facilit facilitate us through an excellent resource titled Get Information, a community safety toolkit um, registration for that session will go live on March 11th. I'm going to put in the chat a link to the resource um, that is currently available. It's a new one that Vision Wind Change has put out for us. And that's the resource that they'll be walking us through on the 25th. We're then going to skip April and we'll be back in May for two sessions on March, May, uh, May 13th and May 27th. On May 13th, we're gonna be joined by Nuri Nosrat of the Ahimsa Collective, who will be sharing a new resource focused on how to have restorative conversations. Um, and then we're gonna have another session on May 27th that'll be announced later. So we have an incredible team. Next slide with us um, today because as you've heard me say before that everything worthwhile is done with others. I'll recognize our interpreters and closed captioner at the end of the session. But for now, um, you'll see on the screen some of the people who are here joining us today. Ebene for tech support. So if you have tech issues, reach out to Ebene. Laura Chow Reeves of uh, Radical Roadmaps is our graphic note taker today. And you can find out more about Laura and Laura's work um, at Laura's website. Um, I'm gonna see if I can find a way to plug that in here. There we go. Um, and yeah, and so Laura always does a great job. Tynetta is here uh, today, uh, tonight, and will be supporting the chat through the session and also allowing us to be able to be more interactive. You can all, um, you're able to drop stuff in the chat. If you have questions or comments, we invite you to drop them in the chat. And again, sincere thanks and appreciation to the whole team for being here, for supporting this session. As we do for all of our um, gatherings, we're gonna get centered in our values for this event. I'm gonna share some words that I appreciate and are adapted from Free Minds, Free People. We believe at the center, we believe that at the center of liberation is radical love for each other and for ourselves. 
that love pushes us to try to create a better world. Because of that, we are working to minimize the amount of harm that occurs in our spaces. White supremacy, misogyny, ableism, classism, homophobia, and transphobia exist everywhere, even in radical spaces. They are some of the threads out of which normative society is woven and it is hard to untangle them. So if you're called out today, particularly in the chat, in some way for perpetuating any of these, please understand that it is not because you are unimportant or that we wish to exclude you. Instead, we're trying to demonstrate compassion and care and do the least amount of harm towards people in our communities, particularly those with marginalized identities. We recognize that we are all entrenched in these systems of oppression and that we all have work to do. We invite everyone to be accountable for their participation within these systems of oppression. We ask everyone to challenge themselves and to fight against it in these spaces. If you enact displays of power, and oppression, we will talk to you. We will invite you to educate yourself, to relearn how to interact with others in the space without enacting harm. If you cannot or are unwilling to address it, we will ask you to leave. We need both love and rage in every part of our lives to carry on dismantling oppression. Both can be part of radical resistance to the destructive world in which we live today. If we put in the effort to truly learn from and care about each other, we seek, um, then we'll be able to seek to forge stronger bonds and to create a community that we can rely on rather than systems of violence. So being accountable to each other for our behavior is a really good way to start. So thank you everybody for going through this with me. Um, it's always important to set the context for the containers that we're in so that we all have a sense and an idea of the values that we're trying to embody, that we're entering into. Um, so we're going to be talking about criminalized survivors and criminalized survival tonight. The conversation we're going to be having is rooted in oppression and violence. And I think it's really important that I name at the beginning that there are survivors of domestic and other forms of violence in this room, that is for sure. There are over 87 of us here right now. So it's certain that some of us are survivors of some form of harm. Um, and I want to just let you know that if you feel at any point that you need to leave or take care of yourself in other ways, please do that. Um, I want to also be clear that I'm dropping in the chat a couple of resources. Um, one is to the, um, uh, to the National Domestic Violence Hotline that you can use and you can chat them um, also live 24 seven. Um, I'm also going to be dropping the link for um, the National Sexual Assault Hotline. So if you find that you need support tonight or you just need to take off and take care of yourself, I really encourage you to do both um, and to take care of your needs at all times. So with that, I want to um, kind of get us situated about what we're going to do. There's also a really useful um, for black people on this call, there's a Beam has put out a virtual wellness directory for people who identify as black to find black practitioners who are, you know, who do yoga, somatics, who are also mental health providers. I'm gonna just drop the Beam Wellness Directory in here as a resource for black folks who need it as well. So what we're gonna do, um, as I mentioned, is talk about um, criminalized survivors and survival tonight using a resource that I um, organized and edited a few couple of years ago um, for uh, us that survived and punished to kind of be able to support people who wanted to 
do political education in their communities or community-based education. Okay, we're gonna swap interpreters, thank you. I'm gonna just be quiet and we're gonna swap interpreters. Wonderful, we're all set, great. So um, just wanted to make sure that everybody um, knew the context for this resource coming into being. Um, we, each of us who are part of Survived and Punished or Survived and Punished Network has been facilitating for many years, various kinds of workshops focused on domestic violence, sexual assault, immigrant um, issues, immigrant rights, trans issues, et cetera. Um, and over time, as we've been doing work with incarcerated and criminalized survivors, we needed to adapt the work that we were doing to fit the actual experiences and context that we were encountering. And so we started doing our own workshops focused on various topics of criminalized survival. Um, and what we I do all the time is if I create something or learn about something, I try to find ways to share it more broadly with people so that um, other people can use it and other people can, you know, kind of learn from it in your own community. And that give, you know, that being said, it's important for me to say that everybody who wrote one of these curriculum units is coming at these topics and ideas from their perspectives and with their experience and with the knowledge that they have from their particular communities. These resources are being provided to you to adapt as you would like, to use as you would like, and you know your communities better than we do. So um, I just wanna put that out there as a caveat. Everybody should have gotten a link to the resource. You might have already flipped through it. You might have already seen it. Um, and you can see on the screen a table of content. And that just kind of lays out the 10 resources that are included in this guide. Most of them are curricula. Some of them offer other kinds of opportunities um, to engage people in conversations about these issues. Um, the first uh, piece, anti-violence advocacy and criminalized survivors, criminalizing survival number two, um, criminalizing Kai Peterson, criminalizing Grisha Meadows, No Lady, which is an activity that I've made and um, facilitate using the No Selves to Defend anthology and a series of discussion questions to engage people in the stories of the historical legacy of um, criminalized survivors and survival. Um, there's a great guide to a reading group that Jane Harris and Ches Brump made a few years ago that helps people um, who, it was a reading group that they ran around community accountability for survivors of sexual violence specifically. And it gives you step-by-step -step session guides of what they did. Um, there's a piece about Marissa Alexander's case that I did as a, as a curriculum unit that I used to run years ago. Um, there's a workshop about black feminist transformative justice responses to violence that was created by Gina Lewis and Anne Russo and then a guide a unit on criminalizing domestic violence that I did. Um, so some of the, the first um, offering on there was Hidgen's, um, Hidgen Shim, um, who made that. And um, the second offering on the table of contents was created by, um, uh, was created by um, Holly Craig and Mothers United Against, um, violence and interest and uh, sorry, and incarceration. You're gonna have to um, give me some grace today. I'm operating on fumes. I've been going, going, going and I'm exhausted. So um, yeah, <laughs> you'll see that. So if you go through this table of contents, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. What I'm gonna try to do today is um, take you through um, basically an active, uh, a unit and you'll experience what that unit is like so that if you're facilitating, you have a better sense of how to go through that and how to move that. So you have a, you experience how it feels to be a participant in the workshop 
but I'm also going to be giving tips and thoughts about how to. So it's both like a thought of a train the trainer a bit, but with you going through some of the activities. I'll share some thoughts about uses of the curriculum units as I've used them. And then finally, we'll have some time for your comments and questions. Please include your questions and your comments in the chat all the way through. Tynetta is keeping track and will um, allow for me to you know, hear some of those questions towards the end. The goal here is to actually focus on being done by 8.15 at the latest. If we're done earlier, great, um, then we'll leave and do what we need to do. But I don't wanna keep everybody for too long tonight. There's a part um, where we will have an opportunity to break out into groups. Um, and I will ask when we get there, whether people feel like you want to do that. Some of you may not be in a position where you can be in a smaller group and we'll see how to work that out as we move along. So I'm gonna facilitate us through the unit that um, I created here called um, uh, Criminalizing Brescia Meadows. Some of you will know um, what Brescia is and uh, what, what Brescia's case is and will know who Brescia Meadows is. Um, and others may be introduced to her for the first time. Um, I'm going to, you're gonna learn more about her and her case as we go through it. And if you already know a lot about her, then this is an opportunity to revisit what happened to Brescia and the, the aftermath. Okay, next slide, please. So we're going to start off by trying to think through what is a definition of criminalization? What is criminalization? We're going to do that by doing a mind map where we put youth at the center of um, this particular um, slide. And if you were doing this in a space, in a room, you would use like a you know, blackboard, or you would use some sort of like huge, you know, newsprint paper, uh, post-it note paper. Um, and so a chart, paper, whatever, and then you would put the youth at the center. So let's begin with folks putting in the chat your responses to the first question, which is, who are the most important people in the lives of children and young people? Who are the most important people in the lives of children and young people? Parents and teachers, caregivers, guardians, siblings, grandparents, peers, friends, coaches, teachers, family, cousins, mentors, yes. Who, other, who are other important people in children's lives? Elders, chosen family, yeah, those are all great. Neighbors, that's a great one. Mothers, pediatricians, school staff, ACS, religious community, yes, absolutely. Godparents, perfect. Aunties and uncles, so important, so important. Okay, so hopefully Tynetta has taken a lot of this stuff down. Let's talk next um, about what are the most important institutions in the lives of children and young people. People started already, social workers, child protective services, school, it's the big one that's coming up, libraries is coming up, yes. Absolutely. Community centers, after school programs like the boys and girls clubs, yeah. People put prisons and detention. 
religious centers, churches, you know, spiritual spaces, medical and healthcare spaces, the neighborhood store. Yeah. Yeah. Town diners, city cafes, employers when they're old enough. Mm -hmm. So employers, local businesses. Wonderful. And you can see that they're gonna refresh and we're gonna see on the slide some of your suggestions, um, some other institutions, parks, park districts, uh, youth centers, and more. The slide will come up soon. So all of these are great. Community-based organizations, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So thinking about some of the things that I didn't see listed here in terms of institutions that have an impact on young people's lives, we didn't include the police and policing of various forms. We didn't include um, the media, which is a huge impact and influence of an institutional player in the lives of young people and all of our lives really. Um, but this was a really great list to begin. So let's talk about, you know, then when we think about all these people who are in the lives of a young person, and we think about all these institutions that are in young people's lives, what kinds of impacts or how do these institutions contribute to the criminalization of young people? How do these institutions contribute in some way to the criminalization of young people? So drop in the chat. Can we think of ways that, yes, yeah, schools by having school police, right? School to prison pipeline. Some of you have heard about that, right? Sometimes people call it the cradle to prison pipeline, yeah? Calling out issues, punitive values um, that punish kids for truancy. Yes, mandatory reporting in the medical industrial complex. This is so important. I don't know how many of you have, um, ex have read um, uh, a participatory action report that was created many years ago now, I think over 10 or 12 years ago by a group called the Young Women's Empowerment Project. The Young Women's Empowerment Project based out of Chicago was a youth led adult supported organization um, for young people uh, who traded sex for money and survival needs. And they did this participatory action research um, project called Girls Do What They Have to Do to Survive. And one of the things that uh, the, one of the most important lessons that came out of that report that was really shocking to me. What do you think the young people said was the most, was the institution that was most criminalizing for them? Where they experienced the most sense of criminalization? What do you think the, the young folks who were involved said about them? They said maybe school, yeah, doctors, yeah, yeah, that's right. Some of you may already have read that, that, um, that report, but it was really stunning to me when I first heard about it, when I first heard them talking about the fact that the place that was the most likely to criminalize them were hospitals, medical professionals. And this, you know, close second was the police, but I would have imagined first it was police, you know, but it was actually first and foremost, um, folks who were uh, part of the medical industrial complex. And it was later that I recognized, yeah, that report is terrific. And they worked with Catlin Fullwood um, and several other wonderful people to pull that report together. It's still available on their website, even though the organization's been closed for several years, um, that, that resource is available. Um, so the thing about that was that um, these young folks would go to the to the medical establishment because they would be hurt or they would need something. And those places would call um, the police or DCFS on them. 
And, um, you know, all of a sudden they would find themselves in the grips of the system again. Many of these young folks who were part of YWEP were already wards of the state. They were already people who were, um, you know, out of their homes in various ways. They were many of the young folks were street-based young people. And so here you were, right? In a place where you ended up having to deal with this institution that was criminalizing you. That was an institution that set up supposedly to help you, to heal you actually, right? When you're hurt. Um, instead, these are institutions that were hurting young people. Um, People have said a lot about schools being criminalizing sites, and that's true, that's true. But there are other places that are also criminalizing sites for young people, particularly young people of color and young people who are variously marginalized. And those are some of our community centers that end up, okay, uh, some of our community centers. And so we're going to switch now. I'm just gonna take a break. Wonderful. So, um, so yeah, so public spaces, like, yes, people are saying public spaces and the parks that don't let a young person just sit on a corner or sit on a bench quietly and just without asking them what they're doing there, who they're waiting for, et cetera. So the constant surveillance um, is something that um, Victor Rios calls hypercriminalization that occurs with young people and particularly young people of color, Ex, you know, particularly young black people. Um, and so that's something we have to constantly be thinking about when we're thinking about criminalization, what it means and how it plays out in the lives of youth and young people. So let's go to the next slide, please, and talk about just the basic definition of terms right now around what is criminalization. If we were all together in a space, we would take these ideas that we've created together in this mind map and try to build a definition amongst ourselves of what criminalization would be based on all the things you've heard from people. So next slide, please. After this one, yeah. So criminalization is the process by which behaviors and individuals are transformed into crime and criminals. Previously legal acts may be transformed into crimes by legislation or judicial decision. Criminalization is a process by which certain practices that have been legal are made illegal. By defining activities associated with certain groups as criminal, those groups themselves come to be seen and treated as dangerous often justifying extreme and even or subtle violence against those people. Next slide, please. The process of criminalization doesn't happen in a vacuum, but rather is a strategy in the continued oppression of marginalized groups, people of color, the poor, women, youth, LGBTQ folks, the disabled, et cetera. And criminalization is not simply the creation of new laws and punishments, but also includes socially defining certain practices or just ways of being as criminal. You think about this, you can think about the way that we've criminalized wearing saggy pants, for example, fining young people for wearing clothes, right? That we deem to be associated with whatever we've decided criminal looks like, you know? Um, we understand the criminalization of youth to be not only legislation to restrict the rights and activities of young people, but a web of cultural impressions, practices, and myths through which youth generally, and especially youth of color, come to be viewed as generally criminal by dominant culture. So it's really important I think um, to think about on a regular basis, the way that criminalization is a central pervasive and ubiquitous phenomenon that impacts the everyday lives of so many young people, marginalized young people. And 
I just will quote one thing that Victor Rio says in, in his book, he says, by the time they formally entered the penal system, many of these, and he was looking at young men in California, uh, were already caught up in a spiral of hypercriminalization and punishment. And the cycle began before their first arrest. It began as they were harassed, profiled, watched, disciplined at young ages before they had committed any crime. And eventually that kind of attention led many of them to fulfill the destiny that was expected of them. And hypercriminalization is important because it involves constant punishment. You know, it's the, and in this case, punishment meaning the process by which individuals come to feel stigmatized, outcast, shamed, defeated, or hopeless as a result of negative interactions and sanctions that are imposed by individuals who represent institutions of social control. So let's just move on from here now that we have a general sense of what criminalization looks like what institutions and people are in the lives of young people. We're gonna kind of go and think a little bit now at a, like a historical grounding of thinking about issues related to the criminalization of girls and young women. I want to remind people that when you do, and many of you have facilitated and done timeline activities, these are never exhaustive reviews of every single issue related to the criminalization of the group or the area or whatever you're focusing on. They're a sampling of, of particular events. And you'll be invited to add your own ideas to the timeline, which is a really important part of doing timeline activities. It is to situate ourselves within the larger legacy of these particular systems of oppression that we're trying to eradicate so that we see ourselves as implicated in it, either as people who resist or as people who are also sometimes the oppressors. So we have to think about them on multi-layers, multi-levels. Um, so there, in the curriculum, there are at least three ways that you can structure the activity depending on the size of the group, the space, et cetera. The one I use, usually like the most is doing gallery walks where you have a lot of wall space. You actually can set up an opportunity for people to put up all these, um, you know, pieces of paper with dates and specific uh, chronological um, ordered, you know, um, kind of moments in history. Maybe you invite people to find a partner, somebody they don't know, and together you can tour the timeline talk while you're doing that you take 15 minutes or so and have those conversations and then when you're done touring you might give people post-it notes and ask them to place particular things they think are missing or they would like to add to the timeline and then you come back and you debrief in our case we're in a virtual space right now which is not um, easy to navigate because like we're all over the place and we're some of you're at home you're whatever so I guess what I want to ask for here is where people, do people feel like you can be in a small group? Um, can, do you, are you okay with being broken up into small groups? And if you have a problem with that, will you put in the chat that you can't be in a small group so that we can see that? If you're somebody who needs interpretation and would need an interpreter, can you put yourself in the chat so that we could put you in a room that would also accommodate? Let Ebene know. Okay. All right. So we're gonna put some of you in small groups. Um, also, uh, Mariam, if yeah. you cannot be in a small group, it will put you there, but you don't have to go. And you can still do the activity. I'll put the slides in the chat so that you, everyone's going to use those slides. Mm -hmm. So don't worry, you don't have to go if you, um, if you can't go. Yeah. So what we'll do is um, folks will be able to choose to get into a breakout room. Ebene will start putting you together for that. 
and um, folks will go into the room. Yeah, okay. You'll just be able to choose. You'll you'll have a chance if you're not interested in doing that, then you don't have to go, okay? Yeah, so if you're there, just don't, you don't have to go on screen. I Next think slide, will be please, Eva. So what you, let's, before you go into, before you move to the room, this is the activity. They're gonna be eight slides. Um, there's going to be a, the slides are gonna be put in the chat for you. Okay, Ebene has the slides. So uh, there's a non-exhaustive timeline of criminalization of girls and young women. Um, you're gonna be with probably four other people in the space or three other people in the space. And what we want you to do is to look at the timeline, think about the things that are surprising to you in the timeline, things that you may not have known before, right? Like flag that for yourselves in conversation. Is this information that you already knew? Is it new information for you? What are some historical moments that you know of that you could add to the timeline? So share those three things with each other. Is this new information? Is this something you already knew? If there's information that's not new to you and you have additional information to share with your group, please do that. And, you know, come back. We're going to come back in like 10 minutes. So take that time, introduce yourselves briefly to each other, and we're going to do that. And then when we come back, we're going to quickly debrief the timeline activity and we're going to move on to the case study of um, Brisha's case. Okay. Thank you all for taking the time to go and talk to people or stay here and check out the slides. Eva, can you move to the next slide, please? So I think for me, um, when I'm writing curriculum, I always think about timelines as a way to share our history of not just oppression, but also our histories of resistance. And to tell a story of the ways that people who've been affected by particular issues have fought back in small and big ways, and also sometimes succeeded in creating social change. Sometimes it's just a good way to linearly see and think of like progression, not that things happen in a progressive way necessarily. It's, you know, one step forward, seven steps back sometimes, but it just gives you a chance to kind of put yourself and situate yourself in the histories of the places that you're focused in on. Um, next slide. And you can see that in these slides, the eight of them um, were starting from pre-1800, um, we're looking at the story of Celia, which is important for the concept of criminalized survival. Next slide. Um, you're seeing, you know, a lot of other situations and stories that have occurred. The first kind of youth prisons, um, the W.E.B. Du Bois's census, again, looking at the numbers in the past and then thinking about this current moments. So I'm wondering if people would just throw in the chat, um, if you can, as a, just a quick uh, debriefing question, what do you all notice in the timeline as a recurring theme? What are some of the recurring themes that you saw when you were looking at the timeline? Drop your responses in the chat. Children treated as adults, criminalized resistance, State offers survivors very little protection. Children, especially black children, constantly dehumanized. Yes, the disproportionate criminalization of black children. Racism, criminalizing of poverty. Yes, blackness is innately deviant. State-sponsored violence, a consistent thread leading up until today. Eva, you can move the slides till we get to the last of the timeline slides. Specific policy designed to criminalize young Black people. Yes, couching criminalization as reform. Yes, and you saw the story of like Billie Holiday's incarceration, you know, as a young person. Things that maybe you hadn't necessarily known, but that is real, you know? And we look at today and the way that folks 
you know, are, um, den- you know, um, dealing with that, you know, that stuff. So you would, you would do this kind of activity, you might just debrief with everybody coming back asking if they learned um, anything, what was surprising, did they notice trends, what's missing from the timeline, what would you add? So you would just kind of take everybody back through that and everyone would get a chance to talk in the larger group. We're not going to do that today because we have, I want to get us through and get us to the point at the end. You, I just wanted you to get an experience of what it's like to do this and um, that, you know, it's something you can facilitate on your own and keep it moving from there. Let's move on. Thank you. Next slide. So Brescia Meadows, the, the unit is criminalizing Brescia Meadows. And um, usually what I do at this point um, is to invite people to hear, you know, hand out copies of Brisha's story. Um, I might ask people to silently read the story first. Um, and that's a way to always invite people who may not be verbal. It looks like we might want to switch off, so. Thank you. Great. So, um, so have people read the case study. Make sure that when you create case studies that they're not 100 pages. Um, <laughs> you don't want a really long thing that people you're going to have people read. So you'll then be able to have folks read it silently. And then you'll ask for a volunteer or two. There's always somebody who will volunteer to read it out loud so everybody can hear it together. Um, if you're working, when I'm doing this kind of session with youth, with young people under the age of 16, let's say, or under the age of, you know, whatever, 16 or 15 or whatever, um, a lot of times the same kind of young people will volunteer to speak out and speak up. Um, and sometimes because literacy is a real issue, people don't volunteer because they're worried about reading out loud. So what I'll do is as the facilitator, I'll take a turn at reading it first myself. Um, I, you know, um, I will take a turn to read out loud as the facilitator, and then I'll ask for a volunteer because that means that people have already heard the words sounded out and people who might be most more more reticent to read out loud are willing to then step up and do it. The other thing I do often is I'll have people read round robin. So I have you read the first sentence or the first two sentences and then silently let somebody else pick up and pick up and pick up. Those of you who are educators have done this often, but just again, small things to encourage participation. So since we're all together now, I'm just gonna quickly read this out. Brisha Meadows was 14 years old when she was arrested for allegedly killing her abusive father in Warren, Ohio on July 28th, 2016. Brisha grew up in a home where her father terrorized her and her family throughout her life. Brisha, her siblings and her mother were all severely beaten by the father for over 17 years. Meadows tried to run away from home and family members tried to take her out of the home. However, law enforcement refused to allow her to escape and threatened to charge family members with kidnapping if they took Brisha out of her home to safety. When police investigated the abuse in the home, they refused to question Brisha outside the presence of her father. Neighbors reported that Brisha's father routinely brandished his gun to the family and to the neighbors. Prior to the shooting, Brisha's father had frequently threatened to shoot the family. To date, Brisha has not been granted pretrial release and is currently being held in a juvenile jail. Prosecutors are contemplating trying her as an adult, and if convicted, she could be sentenced to life in prison. Law enforcement and the legal system failed to help Brisha when she and her family turned to them for help. 
she was left with only two options, defend herself and her family against horrific abuse or potentially die at the hands of her father. Brisha chose to survive, so she defended herself by killing her father. Brisha's arrest is part of a larger trend. An increasing number of girls are being arrested for violent behavior in their home. Researchers have attributed this increase to mandatory arrest or pro-arrest policies in cases of family-based assault. As a result of these policies, many girls are arrested for fights in their home when defending themselves against victimization or as part of a pattern of violence among family members. 84% of girls in juvenile detention have experienced family violence. Additionally, 31% experience sexual abuse, 41% experience physical abuse, 39% emotional abuse. This has led many to describe an abuse to prison pipeline, particularly for girls of color. So you might want to begin um, to kind of debrief the case after this with a series of questions. In the curriculum, I ask always, and I ask this every time for every case study that I offer people to think about is um, what happened, right? What happened? And so you might ask people to put their suggestions in the chat of what happened. So what happened here? Anybody wanna share your thoughts in the chat? What happened in Brisha's story? What are some of the key things that you notice? Feel free to drop in the chat your thoughts. What happened here? She asked for help and was denied by law enforcement in the courts. Thank you, absolutely. What else did you notice? The police were not acting in the girl's best interests. Thank you. The state abandoned her and her family and kept them from accessible help from their community. She was criminalized for her self-defense. She was trapped, thank you. Did you notice some of the institutions in her life that had an impact? What happened with the neighbors? What did the neighbors see? Yeah. The neighbors reported that the father was routinely brandishing his gun. So the neighbors knew what was going on, right? Did Was there a comment? Yes. What about a comment about the school? What did the school do when Brisha asked for help? Clearly, not much, right? Neighbors might have been scared. That's possible. Absolutely. It's scary. Somebody's brandishing a gun and abusing their family. You, you know, you're not sure if you're going to be safe. So maybe you don't intervene, right? What are the other institutions that seem to have not stood up for her? Yes. The cops interviewing Brisha when she's in the, you know, when in front of her father. So she runs away. They bring her back and they interview her in front of her father. Now, if you're being abused, is your response going to be to admit to getting abused in front of your abuser in front of the cops? Mm, I don't think so. Are you going to do that when you're 14, 13, 12? right? And then the institutions come down on her or prosecutors contemplating to try her as an adult at 14. Like, she's not an adult, clearly. Why would she be tried as one? Why would she be facing life in prison for defending her life, right? So these are kinds of, you know, you're going to ask a series of questions about what is going on. The court system failed her. Every system fails her. Yeah. And questions you might ask each other and people, you know, 
what are the factors that led to her criminalization? What are the systems that negatively impacted her life path? One question you might ask is, were there any positive influences? Do you notice any positive influences in this story? What are them? What are those? Anybody step up in a way that feels like useful? Yeah, yes. Family members that wanted to take her away and did, by the way. Her aunt was a cop and her aunt took her and brought her to live with her. And the cops went to the other cop's house to get her to bring her back home. So clearly some things were happening in the, in the community. Yeah, people tried to intervene, people went to places. Yeah. So there were some, there were some, it's, it wasn't just like nothing else was going on that there were positive forces in her life too, right? And you wonder if there were any points where a positive intervention could have made a difference. There were many points at which a positive intervention could have, right? And then the last question that I always like to ask in these case studies is to ask people to think about the alternative ways that the incident could have been handled, you know? The, uh, what other outcomes could have happened here? How could this story have turned out differently? This is a good question to always ask people to think about because there's always an opportunity to intervene in a positive way the next time, especially if you see a situation like this occurring. So I think the things that are helpful to point out in this case study are that a significant number of girls in the criminal punishment system have prior histories of sexual and physical abuse. And they come from families where they may have actually witnessed violence. Many girls in also gender nonconforming youth in, in the system, they are suffering often from depression. They are disproportionately poor. They're disproportionately from racial minority groups. They are they transgress gender identity norms and they're punished for it. Some of these young people are battling addictions of various kinds and overwhelmingly they're undereducated. They've been kicked out of school, pushed out of school, aren't in school for multiple kinds of reasons. Next slide, please. Next slide after this one. So this is a fact sheet that's included in the, in the um, resource that can help you with facts and figures about the about domestic violence and the criminalization of girls. So a way for you to be able to get the facts and figures you need as a facilitator and also references that you can go back to to get deeper information or if you need to be educated yourself as a facilitator, a way to be able to go and read yourself to get more up to speed so you feel more comfortable. Next slide. So I always like to include in whatever I'm doing opportunities for creative work, um, an opportunity for people who've gone through a very difficult series of um, listening to hard things, you know. Um, you often feel so hard, it feels discouraging, you know, you're like, oh my God, this is so hard. There's so much stuff going on. Using creative activities within curricula can help people to activate their imagination, to think of different worlds. And those are always really important. So I'm just gonna read this poem, which is by one of my favorite writers, Mahmoud Darwish, um, Palestinian writer. Um, and so we're gonna read the, the poem called The Prison Cell. And I'll just read it out loud. It is possible it is possible at least sometimes, it is possible especially now, to ride a horse inside a prison cell and run away. It is possible for prison walls to disappear, for the cell to become a distant land without frontiers. What did you do with the walls? I gave them back to the rocks. And what did you do with the ceiling? I turned it into a saddle. And your chain? I turned it into a pencil. The prison guard got angry. He put an end to my dialogue. He said he didn't care for poetry and bolted the door of my cell. He came back to see me in the morning and shouted at me. 
where did all this water come from? I brought it from the Nile. And the trees from the orchards, orchards of Damascus. And the music from my heartbeat. The prison guard got mad. He put an end to my dialogue. He said he didn't like my poetry. He bolted the door of my cell, but he returned in the evening. Where did this moon come from? From the nights of Baghdad and the wine from the vineyards of Algiers and this freedom from the chain you tied me with last night. The prison guard grew so sad. He begged me to give him back his freedom. Um, it's a beautiful piece and um, always makes me think of just the interdependence that we have with each other in the world and that the jailer and the jailed have a lot in common um, and that the jailer is also caged in multiple ways. Um, and a really just a, a really important lesson for that. Next slide. So what we would do um, might be to talk, especially if you're, if you're doing this kind of a training or a workshop, I usually do them with young people. I ask for them to think about freedom. And what does freedom mean to you? You know, what does freedom feel like? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? Um, and just kind of have the opportunity to think these things through. Um, and then you might invite participants to share their freedom dreams for Brisha. Um, you might ask them to use Darwish's poem as inspiration. And you could use prompts. We're not gonna do this today just because for time purposes. And again, I wanna get us out here by 8.15. I wanna leave time for questions also. Um, so, you know, you might give them prompts if people need it, you know, Brisha, I dream of you being free or I wish you freedom too, or my freedom dreams for you, Brisha, are and you would then, if you have time, ask for volunteers to share the prompts or share what they came up with for their freedom dreams for Brisha. For people who don't know, um, I'm, I'm just gonna wrap up this piece and wrap up this story. Um, Brisha is actually free um, through her family's resistance and struggle, uh, through a wonderful defense campaign um, a free Brisha campaign. Um, we were able to first get the prosecutors to uh, not charge her as an adult. That was the first win. Um, and then through pressure, uh, pressuring the DA, pressuring um, other people within the system and a, a good lawyer, um, we were able to get make sure that um that uh basically they they couldn't you know they couldn't continue to harm her indefinitely um and so what ended up happening is uh, they offered Prisha a, a a plea deal of time served plus two months or it was six months of uh incarceration in a mental health facility followed by two years of probation and this all happened uh, in 2016 is when um, the whole thing went down. Anyway, Brisha completed her, um, how do you call it? Um, comp completed her two years of probation last year. She's graduated from high school and she's currently in college, taking college classes. And I think for me, it's always important if you can update the story, obviously to update it. And obviously not all stories end in the same kind of way, um, but it's good when there is a good ending, uh, even if it's not the ending you had hoped for. Um, and I do, you know, maybe we could talk later about what defense campaigns do and don't do. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that like my politics are not Brisha's family's politics or Brisha's politics. And it wasn't my life who was on the line. So I would never tell people what kinds of things to accept in terms of legal deals or anything like that. Or, you know, I believe that forced incarceration in mental health facilities is incarceration. 
Um, but again, you know, the family wanted their daughter out and uh, chose to take the deal that was offered. And that was their choice and the best choice they had available that they wanted to make sure their loved one was safe and um, would be able to live her life um, as a person who had gone through trauma her entire life. So I'm gonna stop here in terms of the, um, the curriculum and moving everybody through it. And that's what you can do through using the resource. I try to offer as many um, kind of options and opportunities, facilitator notes in the ones that I created. And other people also offer similar kinds of facilitator notes to help you move through so that you can, you know, work in your communities to kind of educate people about the factors that lead to the criminalization of young people or the criminalization of adults. Um, the, the, the things that are, you know, um, I don't know, the ways to intervene possibly, um, and also some creative ways to think of something different not possibly occurring. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. So put your questions in the chat. I don't know, Tynetta, if there were questions that were asked before. or comments if you have them as well. Have all of, have some of you already facilitated um, pieces? Yeah, you, you would have been able to get the copy of the, the, the resource was in the, um, the information that was sent in Inventbrite, but I'm sure Somebody will put it in the chat for you again. Yeah, it's there. Great. Thank you, Tanetta. So Tanetta put that in the chat. If you're interested in questions of defense campaigns, you can go to surviveandpunish.org. Lots of information there about defense campaigns and what people do about that. Participatory defense campaigns have a long history um, and uh, there are ways that people who aren't involved in the criminal punishment system but are from the community get together to push for people's freedom. That's basically a defense campaign. Any other questions that folks may have or comments or things that are of interest to you that you, has anybody used this before? You can look on Survived and Punished site. We have a toolkit that helps people create defense campaigns in their communities if they would like. So go to survivedandpunished.org and you can find resources there. Oh, good. So people do these workshops with college students. Any tips for bringing this unit to mostly privileged white? I think it'll work for anybody. I think you can adapt it. You'll know your, you know your young folks better than I do. Um, so you can be really thinking about, you know, the kinds of activities that might resonate with them and then apply it to their context. Yeah. But it's a, you know, I've done these workshops with privileged white pe young people uh, and also I've done them inside um, prisons. So, you know, with young people, overwhelmingly young people of color who are locked up. So it, it, it can be adapted to any spaces. Was thinking about abolishing transforming systems of abuse. Brisha's experiences remind me of how many people and groups are needed to free one person, yes. It's a testament to the necessity of collective action. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, those of us who came together for the Free Brisha Defense Campaign, it was an inordinate amount of work. Um, when I went to Warren, Ohio, when on the on the, the the day that Brisha's trial was supposed to start, um, myself and a couple of other friends um, from Chicago, drove from Chicago over to Warren. And um, 
all part of Love and Protect at the time. And um, we, I think I was just so struck, first of all, when I walked into the courtroom at how small she looked, you know? Like you see people on television or even if a photograph of them and she just looked tiny in her, like over, like skinny and flowing in her, in her uh, uniform, in her prison uniform. She had been, um, she'd been suicidal. So they'd put her on suicide watch. And one of the things we did as a defense campaign was to raise money, a lot of it, $60,000, so that she could go into a private facility um, for mental health evaluation. Now, you know, I have to tell you that most people don't have those options, yeah? And so you think about all the young people who are in these horrible places, suicidal, stressed out, traumatized in the first place, getting not the services they deserve or need. And you recognize that this system is set up to harm people. That's what it's there for. I just don't like, you know, I don't, I don't know how you work in these systems in any way or have any exposure to them and think that they can be reformed. I just don't know what people are thinking most of the time. It's, it's just, these are not reformable systems. Um, they're systems that are designed to crush people. Um, yeah, so these are some other things I would think about. Before getting to a lesson like this for young people experiencing these injustices firsthand, what are some milestones I should strive for building trust first within the group and what classroom practices do you recommend to be sensitive to triggers? Well, I mean, I think it's the same question as any kind of um, subject matter that would be traumatic for young people. You know, I wouldn't do this kind of activity with a group that I had just met. Um, I definitely, you know, you want to have some community having been built in advance. Um, I think you would also want to make sure that um, you probably broke it up a little bit. You might do one activity and then come back if you have an opportunity to break it up over a few days and scaffold it and build up um, to a certain point. In some cases, you might wanna tell the last part first, which is that Brisha did make it out. Um, she didn't end up spending the rest of her life in prison. That might be a way to allow people to also uh, engage with the material from a retrospective perspective, um, rather than thinking that this is occurring now and you know this person is still under the clutches of the system in a negative way. So I would think about all those things as ways to do that. Yeah, yeah. So I am really happy to, um, okay, so how do you navigate a workshop space if a participant gets defensive, especially because they are in some way invested in violent systems? What tactics? Well, I mean, you know, a lot of this work has to come from the setting, the values you set at the beginning of whatever you're doing. So you want to make sure that the values and community agreements are strong, that people understand what is and what is not permissible within the space. Um, if people get defensive, you want to go back to those community agreements and remind everybody about them. Um, so yeah, so it's the same thing you would do for anything. You got to create the structures that allow people to be able to be in a place where they can um, properly live up to those structures. So, yeah, that's my suggestion. So I want to close um, now and um, say thank you to everybody who participated today in this um, session. I want to encourage everybody to thank Mir by Knight, who was our closed caption person. Um, we had two amazing uh, deaf interpreters, Aaron Sanders and Stephanie um, Hakulin, and uh, hearing interpreter, Anthony Diaz. Um, I also want to let people know that on Saturday, we're going to be celebrating a new zine that we've put out called Resurrecting Ruby. And um, you're all invited to join us. Um, we kept the um, it's free and open to the public. I put the link to that workshop in the chat. Um, also want to just say it's really important to support criminalized survivors um, with material resources. 
like people need money. They need a way to live. They need a way to be able to leave their partners and their abusers. Um, and so I think I put at the beginning a link to a series of um, defense campaign support things that people are doing. And so I'm gonna put the link again to ways that you can directly support criminalized survivors with concrete resources. And I hope that people will really do that um, because frankly, that's the way we're going to be able to get a lot of people free um, from violence. And I say this regularly that one of the resources that's a really good anti-violence resource for domestic violence survivors is housing, free housing. Um, and we really have to think about uh, you know, we constantly want to give people services, but what people need a lot of times are concrete ways to be able to get free. And that means a place to live, food, a safe space for their families. Um, and they don't have that. And oftentimes economics keeps people tied to people who harm them. And we really need to do better around that and provide concrete resources to folks. Um, oh my goodness, somebody from Puerto Rico, how lovely. Thank you so much for being here and for joining us. And everybody who was part of this tonight and taking your evening to be here, I'm grateful that you did it. And um, I really hope that these resources that we've created um, help you in your communities because that's really what it's about. It's like, take what we're making and use it, use it because these kinds of conversations are critical to have in our spaces, in our communities. And people will listen to you as somebody who's part of their community much sooner than they'll listen to an outsider. And that's the case over and over again. We're, te like, we're taught that over and over again. And we have to do the work ultimately. We have to take it on. Um, we can't, we can't like, just outsource it to other people to take on. <laughs>